So let me start by um, with a problem um, that I would like to explain, provide an explanation for. Um, it's a problem with modern architecture that, uh, as I'll show, um, a number of people have pointed out. The problem is this. Modern buildings don't easily harmonize with other buildings. What I mean by that is the following. Their proximity to other buildings, including buildings that are themselves modern, rarely results in a beautiful whole, such as a beautiful street or a beautiful square, let alone a beautiful city. As I said, this is something, um, a problem that many people have um, brought up in connection with modern architecture. For example, uh, Tristan Edwards, who is an architect or was an architect, an architectural critic. Um, Peter Collins, who was an architect and architectural historian who wrote a, a classic on uh, changing ideals in modern architecture. John Haldane, uh, probably known to you, a uh, philosopher. Roger Scruton, probably also known to you, a uh, philosopher. John Silber uh, was a philosopher. He was also um, the uh, former president of Boston University and a politician. Uh, Paul Rudolph, or at least active in politics. Paul Rudolph uh, was an architect, uh, once dean of the Yale School of Architecture. Robert Stern, uh, similarly, uh, architect and also, at least at one point, dean of the Yale School of Architecture. Brian Rennix and Nathan Robinson may be known to you. They write for, uh, at least one of them founded, I think, uh, Current Affairs, an online magazine. And I could mention um, more people, of course, uh, Prince Charles and so on, probably also known to you. So let me give a, a few examples of um, maybe a few quotations. Um, this one is from Paul Rudolph, uh, so the architect, um, former dean of the Yale School of Architecture, who was responsible for, for example, this building in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, our concepts of zoning and the law, our education to planners and sheer habit results in our seldom building places but collections of freestanding, sorry, freestanding objects unrelated to each other or their particular place. And elsewhere, he writes, my generation makes a mess of the environment and we cannot make cities, as we architects cannot make cities, not cohesive cities or even one building next to another. Of course, uh, what he means by that is not that, uh, it's impossible for architects to design a building that is physically next to another building, located okay, uh, next to another building, but the building is somehow related okay, uh, in a proper way to the buildings um, in its vicinity. Okay, so this is, uh, these are some quotations. Here is one from Scruton. There's perhaps no more effective way of understanding the lack of civility of the modernist building types than by seeing how badly they fit to their neighbors, even when attempting to maintain a common scale. Not only do they clash with the old vernacular buildings, they also clash hideously with each other." End of quote. That's from his book, uh, The Classical Vernacular. To illustrate the problem, uh, let me show you some pictures. By the way, uh, instead of lack of civility, people have also used uh, other expressions to refer to this problem. Uh, for example, um, modern buildings have been called uncivil or selfish or unsociable okay, by other writers uh, besides Scruton. Here's an example from uh, my old environment uh, in Brussels. So these buildings are physically, of course, um, next to each other. Okay? Um, but there seems to be no relation um, between them. Um, I'll come back to what exactly that means, but they, they don't seem to form a harmonious whole. 
this is more or less uh, the problem I'm pointing to. Here's an example from my current environment in Hong Kong, uh, so Kowloon Bay, more or less the same uh, problem arises here. There are already some explanations in the literature for why this problem um, exists. So let me go rather quickly through some of the some of these explanations and then um, come up with my own explanation. Here's one from John Silver. Um, according to John Silver, modern buildings don't harmonize because they're supposed to stand out so that architects can draw attention to themselves as their genius-like creators. This is an explanation, uh, at least the basis of the explanation you can already find in Edwards, book uh, from 1924. Um, he also pointed out that uh, in the modern style, um, or by building in the modern style, the architect may gain a certain notoriety. And it may not be necessarily the architect himself who is uh, after this, but it may also be, of course, the people who commission uh, the architect. He may want to hire a star architect to draw attention to um, their building, their company, their brand, or whatever. So this is one um, sort of explanation. And I think it works for some cases, like uh, the Frank Gehry uh, style extravaganza, yeah. uh, like this one in Prague, which clearly stands out right, from the uh, built environment. But I don't think it works for all cases, it's not uh, general enough an explanation. Let me point out three problems with it. First of all, it doesn't explain the unharmonious character of the anonymous glass box that modern architecture has long been associated with. Uh, let me give you an example in case uh, one doesn't come to mind immediately. Okay, this is a, a classic, yeah, but of course, now you see this one or this type of building all around you in modern cities. So this doesn't seem to fit exactly this explanation, yeah? um, this kind of building, and especially the fact that these buildings are nowadays regarded as um, anonymous. Uh, so they don't really seem to contain the architect's signature or so. Another problem is the following, the failure, it doesn't explain the failure of contemporary attempts at making modern buildings fit in. At least if you can take these attempts at face value, okay, so modern architects or contemporary architects do at least uh, claim to uh, try to make their buildings fit in to an existing environment, but even so they fail. Okay? Um, more often than not, it seems. Okay, so how come when this, at least again, if we can take it at face value, the intention right, to fit in, how come they still fail when that intention is present, okay, when they don't try to maybe stand out and draw attention to themselves? Uh, as in this case, this is a, again an example from Brussels, the National Theatre, which on the architect's uh, website is described as circumspectly nestled into tight inner city fabric. So I think one may want to take issue with this uh, description, okay? the circumspectly at least uh, aspect of it. And then finally, another problem, but maybe not a, um, it's not really a knockdown argument against this explanation, but I'll mention it anyway. It doesn't explain why architectural critics and historians have tended to conspire with this rather base and personal motive, you know, trying to draw attention to yourself, uh, become famous or so. Because as a matter of fact, architectural critics and historians have heaped praise on these buildings. So there's another explanation. Uh, this I could have provided more in the full text. I, I looked at another explanation, but here is one that I would like to take as a point of departure. Um, I would like to um, elaborate on. 
yeah, I think it's not satisfying as it stands, but I, I think it can serve as a point of departure. Um, according to Roger Scruton, modern buildings don't harmonize because they haven't been designed in accordance with an architectural grammar, what he calls an architectural grammar. What he means by that is this, a set of flexible rules that can guide the architect in the design process, particularly when decisions are to be made regarding the combination of architectural elements, such as columns and doors and, and so on. If you wonder what, what is meant by an, or if you want to have an example of an architectural grammar, I guess the clearest case is this, the, uh, the five orders of classical architecture, um, but it doesn't have to be as formal and precise as uh, these orders. It can also be something more informal, less explicit, uh, somehow uh, present within a practice. So what he means more generally, what Scruton means more generally by an architectural grammar is this. Briefly, I mean a tradition of patterns adapted to the uses of the ordinary builder and capable of creating accurate and harmony in all the many circumstances of potential conflict, end of quote. Right, so it's a, a tradition of patterns that is capable of creating accurate and harmony Again, some examples. Um, this is Scruton's own example. It's not his uh, photo or the photo he includes in the book, but it's from the same street in London. Um, so that's what he has in mind right, by uh, buildings that have been designed in accordance with an architectural grammar. Here's an example from uh, Brussels again. So, Again, this, these, are, these buildings are not obviously in the classical style. You could say it's kind of a local vernacular, okay? but nonetheless, you can spot a pattern that is exemplified by the different houses here. Um, the houses are all different, right? They have different colors and so on. Um, but at the same time, there's also unity and diversity. If you uh, pay attention to the uh, lintels above doors and windows, uh, the grills, of the balconies, uh, the corbels, uh, beneath them, uh, the bell courses and so on. These are all recurrent uh, elements okay, that, that can create um, a sense of um, harmony or unity and diversity. In case you're wondering if this is all, these are all Western examples. Uh, a former student of mine once came up with uh, this example of uh, a regional example uh, from uh, Guangdong province in, in Chikang. Um, of course, these houses are in a hybrid style, okay? so a little bit westernized. It's just for your consideration. Now, um, as I said, I think Scruton's explanation is not entirely satisfying as it stands because it's incomplete. Uh, it leaves the following two questions unanswered. Okay? Um, so more generally, the question is, why is modern architecture different from traditional architecture in this respect? For example, why did modern architecture not develop its own harmonizing grammar? And could it still develop such a grammar in the future? So these are actually the questions I would like to answer in this talk. And so in this way, I would like to extend um, Scruton's explanation so they can answer these questions, doesn't leave them as open questions. More specifically, um, my explanation would be the following one. Modern architecture is incapable of developing a harmonizing grammar because first of all, harmonization would lead to humanization. Whereas secondly, the motive at the heart of modern architecture is dehumanization. I will take each of these um, claims in turn. So I'll start with the first one, then I'll turn to the second one, and then I'll try to explain why this uh, makes modern architecture incapable of developing a harmonizing grammar. Of course, if it's incapable of developing a harmonizing grammar, then we have an answer to the question, 
as to why it hasn't yet developed such a grammar and also why uh, or whether it could develop such a grammar in the future. But before I start, I should, um, or before I elaborate on my explanation and try to provide some support for each of the different elements, um, I think a terminological note is in order because the term humanization could easily lead to misunderstandings. Um, it has, of course, there's multiple meanings if you look it up in the dictionary, and it, of course, has a uh, negative connotation. It's, a, it's a, a, a pejorative. Uh, but that's not the way I'm using it here. I'm using it uh, more or less the way um, another philosopher has used it, and I'll mention it uh, in a moment, in a purely descriptive manner. So I use humanization to refer to the action or process of making something more humane in the sense of gentle or tender, soften, that's from the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, spelling out one of the senses of humanization, as opposed to making it harsher or more severe. More literally, what I have in mind is the process of making something more agreeable or easier to engage with, where easier means that no special effort or talent is required, abilities and dispositions that are widespread in the human population will do. So, you could say that in this sense, you could say, for example, of a, a prison, that the, uh, the prison has been humanized or so, the conditions in the prison have been humanized in this sense. Let me now try to provide some support for this first uh, part of the claim, just to remind you, uh, the first part is uh, this harmonization leads to humanization. And let me try to explain why I think that's the case. I think there are uh, three reasons for why harmonization leads to humanization in architecture. First of all, harmonizing is a way of appearing respectful and cooperative because you at least seem to take the existence of um, the other buildings uh, into account when you harmonize uh, or try to harmonize your building. Um, so it's a way of appearing respectful and cooperative. You, uh, you could say it's a, for that reason, a manifestation of good manners uh, in architecture. That's also, I think, why um, buildings that don't harmonize have been called asocial right, and selfish and so on. Secondly, harmonizing is a way of forming larger visual holes. What I mean by that is that when buildings harmonize, they seem to form a larger hole, such as a street or a square or a neighborhood. So it's not just that there is a street and a, or a square or a neighborhood, but it also um, creates that impression. Uh, it seems like there's a larger hole that emerges and that can attract um, or draw attention when buildings harmonize. And then uh, finally, if harmonizing is achieved by means of a grammar, as in the case of the of what Scruton calls a classical vernacular, for example, in this London neighborhood, then it's bound to bear a cultural imprint. So the imprint of something that we share with other members of our uh, culture, but not necessarily with everyone. Uh, so that can give us a sense of uh, familiarity or recognition or belonging. For all of these reasons, one, two, and three, I think that a harmonizing grammar is bound to answer to a fundamental human desire, or at least to several fundamental human desires, and so to constitute a form of humanization in the sense that I just um, spelled out. So just to maybe uh, summarize this, um, it would satisfy uh, or answer to our desire uh, 
for friendliness, conviviality, also our desire for visual order, and uh, finally our desire for belonging. So that um, concludes my discussion of one, okay? but there's also the second part uh, to my explanation, uh, which just to remind you is this one. The motive at the heart of modern architecture is dehumanization. So this is what I'm going to try to convince you of uh, next. I will here take my starting point in the work of, um, or in one um, book by Ortega y Gasset, at least it was eventually published as a book, um, but not originally, if I remember well, in 1925, um, the dehumanization of art. That's why I also use the term dehumanization because it's been used by him already um, in his discussion of modern art or more specifically modernist art. Um, in case you have never heard of Ortega y Gasset, he was a Spanish philosopher and his most famous work is probably the revolt of the masses. So let me first explain briefly what Ortega Iga said, uh, or Ortega um, said about modern art, uh, his interpretation or his understanding of the motives behind modern art. Um, because I think those motives are also present more generally um, in modern architecture. According to Ortega, modern artists wanted to make art that is of aesthetic interest only, in the sense that it yields purely aesthetic pleasure. So they wanted to purify art in that sense, to make an art that is or can only be of aesthetic interest. Now, as you recognized, Ortega, that ideal of an art that yields purely aesthetic pleasure um, may well be impossible to achieve, but it's possible to work towards it by a progressive elimination of everything that makes art attractive, uh, so pleasurable for non-aesthetic reasons. So what has to be eliminated then? Where are these sources of non-aesthetic pleasure to be found? Um, according to him, um, I think it's all, also plausible, uh, most likely these sources of non-aesthetic pleasure are to, will be part of the representational content of a work, um, of what it represents, okay, what it depicts, for example, or, or the story that it's telling. After all, there we may encounter the same realities that interest us also outside of art, uh, namely, uh, or for example, people in emotion provoking situations that may arouse our sympathy or curiosity. Hence, as a result, we get the suppression of representational content in modernist works, what is commonly known as abstraction. That is, according to Ortega, this is how he explains uh, abstraction. So abstraction would be in the service of dehumanization, which would be in the service of purification, the purification of art. So schematically, that's Ortega's uh, interpretation. Now I would like to apply this to the case of architecture, not because it's not mentioned by Ortega himself, that a similar tendency is towards dehumanization can be discerned in modern architecture. Of course, buildings usually uh, don't have representational content or at least not much representational content. Um, so what is abstracted is not uh, representational content, um, but something else, namely the functions. The functions are abstracted from traditional building types, such as the Dutch canal house. I'll explain this uh, further in a moment. Of course, um, 
The functions cannot be abstracted away. Okay? We always need to have some functions. Okay? And also in modernist art, art we'll of course still find some, uh, in a lot of modernist art at least, you will fi still find some representational content. Okay? Um, but the functions can be reduced to a few elementary ones. Just like the representational content of a work can be reduced, it can become a schematic. Um, in a similar way, the functions of a building can be reduced to a few elementary ones to prevent a strong non-aesthetic interest in the building. For example, a house can be so close to meeting only the definitional requirements for a house that one cannot imagine oneself actually living and settling in it. So the living and settling, this would refer to um, these other functions, okay? uh, these other expectations that we have concerning uh, houses, um, that they be homely okay? somehow. Um, this is, as it were, um, eliminated in favor of um, a few elementary functions that are simply part of the definition of a house or not much more than that, at least as in this definition, well, or, or task description um, for a house by uh, Le Corbusier. Um, a house for him is a shelter against heat, cold, rain, thieves, and the inquisitive, a receptacle for light and sun, a certain number of cells appropriated um, to cooking, work, and personal life. As you can, I guess, easily tell, this barely adds anything to the dictionary definition of a house, but it does add something, I guess. Uh, so here are some examples um, of modernist classics or, or modern classics of architecture um, that I think uh, fit this picture of abstraction because they meet, say they barely meet the definitional requirements. They don't even meet the requirements that Le Corbusier uh, specifies in this description that I just quoted. Uh, for example, this um, the Farnsworth House by Ms. Van der Rohe, okay? uh, the person who, uh, Ms. Farnsworth, who was supposed to uh, occupy it, live in it, okay? found it basically unlivable okay? um, for reasons that you can easily imagine. Well, she felt like an animal in a cage. Everyone could constantly uh, see her. So there was no privacy okay? in contrast or very little in contrast with what uh, Le Corbusier's specification requires, right? Uh, shelter against the inquisitive. Okay? It was not like that. Um, and it was also not a shelter against heat and cold because it would amplify like these other houses, uh, similar houses, it would amplify fluctuations in the outside temperature. Um, but of course it does have a roof, okay? uh, although it may leak the roof as well. Um, so it barely meets the definitional requirements and, and doesn't even meet Le Corbusier's requirements. Uh, this is from inside. Okay, again, very little uh, protection against the inquisitive in the bedroom. Okay. Um, here, uh, this is uh, inspired by, I guess, uh, Ms. van der Rohe's example, even though it was uh, built before it, okay, uh, but I think designed after uh, Ms. van der Rohe's. Uh, Philip Johnson's glass house, uh, you can just see through, of course. Uh, there's just a little bit of privacy here. Okay. Um, um, but also, I suppose, not too easy to live in because Philip Johnson built himself another house, the Brick House, um, uh, not too far from it on the same land, which offered a bit more privacy. Here's another example. Uh, so just to make it also clear that this doesn't just apply to modernist works or works of architecture, but also to the postmodernist ones, the constructivist and so on. 
Um, this is uh, Peter Eisenman's House 6, um, which has this very, I think, uh, well, awkward uh, separation of the two beds in the master bedroom. Um, he proposed, by the way, that he, uh, to the owners of the house that he could build them another house in which they could actually live. So this was almost like a purely aesthetic object, okay, which again fits, I think, Ortega's um, description very well. And perhaps um, this could be another example okay, uh, in the more postmodernist tradition, okay, uh, Remco House, Maison à Bordeaux. There's a, a documentary about what it's like to live in this house. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to uh, watch it yet. Now, these are, of course, all examples, um, as I said, of classics of modern architecture. Right? So you maybe you could think maybe it doesn't generalize uh, what I've just said. But in fact, um, at least uh, Howard Davis um, has made a very similar point about the modern vernacular. Okay? So the less um, artistic examples of modern architecture. According to Howard Davis, modern building types, and by modern building types, he means uh, the, really the vernacular, the very common buildings, such as this one. This is a shopping mall in um, uh, Kowloon City. Uh, uh, never fails to make me uh, depressed. Um, it's, I think, a very uh, common example. I mean, it, it, um, the other building types that he is thinking of are gas stations, building uh, buildings next to gas stations, and so on. Okay? Uh, certain uh, restaurants. Modern building types tend to satisfy needs that can be expressed in explicit and quantifiable ways. Okay? So. These are the elementary functions that I mentioned before um, that are retained, okay? but not needs that are more emotionally felt that affect people in their hearts and memories. Um, so think again of uh, imagining to actually live and settle in a certain building. Uh, so these kinds of thoughts or desires are not really um, provoked by these kinds of buildings. All right, so that's what I, how I try to explain what abstraction in architecture amounts to. Okay. Abstraction in architecture has four predictable consequences. First of all, it becomes easier to experiment with the form of a building if you only retain a few elementary functions, okay, because then there are fewer requirements that uh, at least functional requirements that impose constraints on the form of a building. For similar reasons, it becomes harder to infer the function of a building from its outward appearance. Again, because these elementary functions impose very few constraints. So you can have uh, a museum of modern art that looks like a factory, for example. Third, ornaments become obsolete, superfluous, because they don't serve any of these elementary functions, like providing shelter or so. That's not something that you need an ornament for. And finally, buildings become less practical, less convenient, um, because again, you only retain a few of the functions, perhaps the functions that can be made explicit, quantified, or whatever. Um, whereas traditional building types have evolved in response to a complex web of demands and expectations. Um, and these are not fully retained as a result of abstraction. So at least in some respects, the buildings will um, be experienced as 
impractical, inconvenient, and so on. And I think, again, the modernist examples that I showed earlier could easily illustrate this. So the reason why I draw attention to these consequences, I think these are more or less a priori uh, consequences. I mean, consequences that follow more or less immediately from the uh, fact of abstraction. The importance of it is that the, all of these consequences have been observed as a matter of fact. Uh, so people have pointed out, have observed these consequences, not as consequences of abstraction uh, necessarily, but they have uh, observed the consequences. And I think this could provide more evidence for um, my second point, that the um, motive behind modern architecture is one of dehumanization. So this is one piece of evidence, uh, the consequences of abstraction, which have been observed. Another piece of evidence is the following, um, has to do with the way buildings, modern buildings have been produced in the 20th century. Uh, in a very similar way to the way modern works of art or works of fine art have been produced using, for example, uh, algorithms or uh, chance. In the case of architecture, it's mainly um, standardization and mass production that have been promoted by various modern architects, including uh, Le Corbusier. Um, and it's not just that, for example, Le Corbusier accepted standardization and mass production as a, as a necessity or so. Uh, he also saw it in this way but he really embraced it and uh, even aestheticized it. Again, the goal seems to have been to prevent something that is easily enjoyed for non-aesthetic reasons, skill, craftsmanship, creativity, wisdom, and so on. These are all sources of non-aesthetic pleasure from making an impression on people and contaminating their aesthetic pleasure. So making it less pure. So these elements, at least this is one possible interpretation of what has been going on. Okay, so like, um, if that interpretation is correct, it could serve as further evidence for this uh, second claim. So the picture that we get then is this, abstraction and standardization jointly contribute to dehumanization, which um, contributes to purification. That would be the extension of uh, Ortega's explanation and the application of it to architecture. Of course, if, um, I mean, in principle, so even though I've adopted or um, applied Ortega's explanation to architecture, um, in principle, it could be that his explanation works for as far as I'm concerned, works for architecture and not for modern fine art. But of course, if it works for modern fine art, I think that would also um, provide so further support uh, for my explanation. Because it would be part of a, a larger trend. It could also explain, I mean, if dehumanization is indeed a fact or uh, a driving force behind modern architecture, you could also explain certain um, things that modern architects have said, yeah, such as this uh, quip, uh, humoristic remark by Philip Johnson. What about the people, uh, Philip Johnson says? Don't you care about people at all? The answer is no, of course. I mean, I respect the scale of a human being, but the people themselves, what have they got to do with architecture? And then in support of the two elements together, one and two, okay, so uh, maybe just because you may have uh, lost track at this point, let me maybe just go back um, and remind you what one and two are. Um, so harmonization would lead to humanization is the first one. Second one is the motive at the heart of modern architecture is dehumanization. Okay? Um, so if you take them together, then basically modern architecture would resist uh, 
harmonization, right? Because it leads to humanization. Um, and that can also be supported by things that modern architects have said. Uh, so that's again, an additional piece of evidence. Of course, all of this evidence is somewhat fragmentary. Uh, I'm trying to put it all together to make a solid case. Of course, it will always fall short of proof, right? as I'm sure some of you will point out in the Q&A. Um, so several modern architects have openly questioned the importance of harmony. Um, and I could give you more quotations um, or, or mention uh, more occasions, um, but here are a couple. Uh, this The first one is a quotation from um, Peter Eisenman, something he said in a debate uh, with Christopher Alexander. Um, I think you, that means Christopher Alexander, you should just feel this harmony is something that the majority of the people need and want. So if you like, this acknowledges that there is this fundamental human desire for harmony. So it could lead to humanization in a way this is acknowledged here in the quotation. But uh, he um, continues, equally, there must be people out there like myself who feel the need for incongruity, disharmony, and so on. Here is another quotation, a more recent one, um, from uh, Richard Rogers, something he said in an interview with the Financial Times uh, not so long ago. The idea that a building should take its lessons from all the buildings around it, I don't know what that means. That is somewhat indirect. Um, it seems uh, indifference, at least, yeah, uh, towards uh, the need to harmonize buildings. Right, so, so far, um, I've tried to support one and two in my explanation. But I would also like to um, make my claim stronger okay, in order to be able to provide an answer to the two initial questions, why modern architecture hasn't yet developed such a grammar and whether it could still develop such a grammar in the future. I need something stronger than one and two. I need to go beyond the present moment to say something about the future. Um, so I, I'm going to try to strengthen this claim a little bit to make it more than just a combination of causal claims. Okay? Um, harmonization leads to humanization. The motive at the heart of modern architecture is dehumanization. These seem to be just causal claims. Uh, they don't maybe say something about the uh, nature of modern architecture. Okay? Uh, maybe it just so happens that modern architecture evolved in this way. Uh, so I'd like to make it actually part of the essence of modern architecture in this uh, last part of my talk. Um, so um, for this, I, I will have to rely on a certain conception of what a style is, an artistic style, architectural style. And uh, this conception is um, borrowed from the philosophy of biology, uh, as you will see in a moment. So modern architecture is a style. Okay? That's how I at least uh, conceive of it. And styles are like syndromes in that both are non-accidentally related to an underlying process. So it's not just that you have certain uh, characteristic visual features, for example, but there's also a non-accidental relation with a process that is responsible for these observable features. Okay? And this process is actually part of uh, the style, uh, if you like, part of its definition. Uh, in the case of um, styles, the process is a psychological process, for example, a set of connected motives. Uh, think of the motive to um, purify art by dehumanizing it. It's a, a motive. Um, in the case of syndromes, uh, you can think of uh, a biological process. But if that's right, then it's plausible to consider styles and syndromes as examples of homeostatic property clusters, uh, at least what are called 
homeostatic property clusters. The idea comes from uh, Richard Boyd, who uh, conceived of uh, biological species okay, in this way. But I think the idea also applies to uh, styles. What this means in very general terms, a homeostatic property cluster is the following, but actually there's more to it, but I think these are the most important parts. There's a family of properties that are contingently clustered in the sense that they co-occur in an important number of cases. And second, their co-occurrence is at least typically the result of what may be metaphorically, sometimes literally described as a sort of homeostasis, either the presence of some of the properties in this family of properties tends under appropriate conditions to favor the presence of the others, or there are underlying mechanisms or processes that tend to maintain the presence of the properties in F or both. So that's what he means by, um, well, that's what you have when you have a homeostatic property cluster. And I think that's what you have when you have um, a certain style such as modern architecture. But let me explain this a little bit uh, more. Um, for example, modern architecture consists of a set of features that tend to co-occur, is occur together uh, in the same uh, instance. Curtain walls, open floor plans, materials such as glass, steel, and sometimes exposed reinforced concrete, flat roofs, horizontal windows, uh, strip windows, no ornamentation, and so on. Okay, so these are the typical features that get mentioned in the historical surveys. Um, because they tend to occur together, they typify modern buildings. Moreover, their tendency to co-occur is explained, at least in part, if what I've said before is right, by an underlying mechanism, such as the purifying by dehumanizing motive. This underlying mechanism too is part of what modern architecture consists of. Okay, what I'm claiming here is there is such an underlying mechanism, okay, an underlying process that is part of the style. Um, but of course, it could be another process than the one that I've uh, suggested. Okay? That of course is something that my, the first part of my talk is supposed to have made plausible. Okay? But in principle, the two parts could be separated. Um, to be sure, the mechanism may change over time. That means the mechanism that, or the process that's responsible for these observable features okay, and for the development, for example, of modern architecture. But if the original mechanism behind the style development is replaced in its entirety, or more radically, if it's replaced with a mechanism that works against it, that favors a, the opposite outcome, humanization, for example, then a new style must have emerged, okay, at least on this conception of what a style is. My sense is that this would also be the best description of a situation in which a humanizing grammar is added to modern architecture for the reason that it is humanizing. If it is added uh, for that reason, certainly if it's added for that reason, it seems then you go against the defining motive okay, of that style, if that motive is, of course, humanization. Yeah, sorry, dehumanization. Um, maybe just by way of um, closing, uh, I'm almost done and it's almost one hour. Uh, note that a humanizing grammar is something more fundamental and comprehensive than each of the following. Humanizing features such as organic shapes, warm materials such as wood, softer color tones, roof gardens, green walls, and so on, as in this case, this is uh, an example from um, Hong Kong shopping mall, okay, uh, slightly more attractive than the one I showed earlier, uh, designed by Con Peterson Fox, an American firm, uh, as a green wall um, and roof gardens and so on, uh, softer color tones. Um, so of course, modern architects um, already 
for some time have been adding such humanizing features to their designs. Okay? But in an individual building, it seems that are, these are just like patches, like um, uh, patches on a, on a wound or something, right? And certainly um, when you look at uh, the environment as a whole, not at the individual building, it seems that um, their significance just vanishes, the significance of these uh, humanizing features. So a humanizing grammar is something much more comprehensive and profound, um, also more comprehensive and profound than the imposition of a building code in a certain area, such as this. Uh, that's the area, not exactly the street, but the area where I live. Okay. Um, there is, uh, I mean, these buildings, modern buildings have been designed according to um, certain principles. Okay. Uh, it, it's quite clear that they follow a certain uh, model or, or um, um, to avoid um, clashes, to create some sort of uniformity. But um, that's not exactly what uh, is meant by harmony. Okay? So maybe there's some um, a certain degree of uniformity and avoidance of clashes, but not really harmony in the sense that uh, I think is lacking more generally in uh, modern environments. And um, also, of course, this is a, this building code is not something that is really been made part of modern architecture. It's not that it's uh, somehow spread and became part of modern architecture. Uh, it's something very local that has been imposed uh, like an external thing uh, on uh, the design of these buildings. Right, so this is just to highlight um, the difference with an architectural grammar. Um, to conclude, Modern buildings don't easily harmonize with other buildings, regardless of whether the latter are themselves modern. That was the problem that I started from. This is an often observed fact about modern architecture, which so far hasn't received a satisfactory explanation. The explanation I have defended in this paper is that modern architecture is incapable of developing patterns that facilitate harmonizing because such patterns would humanize buildings while modern architecture is a homeostatic property cluster with a dehumanizing motive at its core. Right, that's, that's it.